Collaboration, Kelly, and the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association. And I am delighted to introduce Carol Kirshner, who is the founder of the CBS Diversity Program, who is a director of the WGA Showrunner Program, uh, an author, an international speaker, and also an entertainment career coach, and a very impressive resume. And I'm also... Uh, I'm not going to mention a lot of other things that I've read about you because I'm sure you're going to tell us all about it. So we're going to start with the question, how did you get started in this industry? Sure. sure. Well, um, I actually started as a stand-up comic, huh. um, but I was working in a museum as the assistant to the director of the museum. Mm -hmm. And that was during the day. And at night I was a comic, not a great one, but a pretty good one. And then one of the volunteers from the museum said, I have a, this was in Los Angeles, because uh, that's where I'm from, said, I have a friend who's a television writer who's starting a production company and he's looking for an assistant. Are you interested? And I said, no, I'm not, because I was sure I was going to be a big time uh, uh, comic. And then that night when I thought about it, I said, are you insane? So I said, yes. And that was my first job in the entertainment industry. I was, a, I was their assistant. I was his gopher. I read scripts. I house sat. I babysat. I dog sat. I took his clothes to the laundry, but to the cleaners. But I also got to sit in on every meeting with every writer. They did TV movies and television series. And I was on set. And it was a great way to break in. Mm -hmm. um, and then after about five years, I realized I'd gone as far at the company as I could. It was never going to be me as a principal. So I launched a campaign. I met with 35 people that I'd met through that job. And I got a job at CBS in comedy development. I spent four years there. And after that, I was brought over to Steven Spielberg's first Amblin television department to help run that, set it up and run it, which I did. Then I became an international development executive for a French company and an English company being their US development department. And then one day when I was in Montreal, I realized that my two-year-old daughter was being raised by my husband and the nanny. And that is not why I had a child. So I talked to my husband, we changed our lifestyle. And instead of an executive, I became a consultant. Mm -hmm. And the best decision I ever made. And as a consultant, I created, as you said, the CBS Diversity Institute Writers Mentoring Program, which we're now in year 17. And I run that. Um, and because of my work with CBS, I was asked to help uh, showrunner and writer producer Jeff Melvoin developed the curriculum for the Writers Guild of America showrunner training program. And I am the director of that. And we are in year 16. Um, it is very gratifying with people from my CBS program, which is for baby writers, brand new writers just breaking in. When those alumni get into my showrunner training program, which is for TV writers at the highest level, mm -hmm. um, and I also, as I said, I'm an international speaker. About seven years ago, I wrote a book called Hollywood Game Plan, How to Land a Job in Film, TV, or Digital Entertainment. It was the hardest thing I ever did. It took me a year and a half. I gained 10 pounds and I developed a rash. And the reason why is even though I had been working with writers my whole career and respected them. I myself had never written anything. Mm -hmm. So after that experience, and the book has been quite successful, it's used in colleges and universities across the country. And I just found out that it's being used at Stanford. So yay. Um, and uh, I have a new appreciation for writers even more than I had before. And I'm an entertainment career coach because while I love my programs, I really am gratified when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, which I do in my career coaching business. So that's my story in a nutshell. Yeah. And how different is entertainment career coach from a manager? Really good question. Yeah. Um, an 
Do not chase the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Do not ask what is going on right now, what's in demand, because that will fluctuate and you start on something now and it'll be different three, five, six months from now. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is find something that only you can write, something that is super personal to you, like um, Issa Rae did with Awkward Black Girl that turned into Insecure on HBO, like the women that did um, uh, Broad City um, as a web series and then became a television series. Uh, Fleabag was super personal story that only she could have written. Uh, Russian Dial was very personal to that person. You want to have your unique voice expressed in your material. Mm -hmm. Do not go, oh my God, they're doing sci-fi. So I'm going to write a sci-fi. If you're not in love with sci-fi, it, it won't help you ultimately. Mm -hmm. The great thing about right now, let's just talk about television for a minute, is there's 500 plus mm -hmm. scripted shows on television mm -hmm. with cable companies, networks, and streamers. They are desperate for content. But the content they're interested in is very personal, specific content. If somebody's looking for a procedural, they're going to go to somebody who's already experienced, who's already done it for years. But if you have your story that no one else can tell, I had a client who was actually raised in a cult and she took her show out and she said, okay, so I was raised in a cult. And it got people leaning forward and she sold her project because she was the only one that could write that. And now is the time. There is opportunity for new voices. They are hungry for new voices. They're searching for new voices. So write something that is unique and specific to you, but also universal. Like Rami. Rami was based on his life story um, and his stand-up act, but he has a unique way in and the only person to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, that's fantastic practical advice because I think people don't realize that every one of those writers has something so different about them and that's what they need to really project on, on right. that final draft. <laughs> With the initial email, and, and yeah. that's, that's very important. Just like with personal introduction, you only have one chance of making that first impression with that first email. And you have so, many, so much experience with looking through those pitches. What would make you want to read that pitch just based on that cover letter or initial email? email? And what would make you say, eh, it's probably not my kind of person to work with? Right. Um, and we're talking about somebody that's pitching, again, TV, pitching a TV show or pitching a motion picture, yes. right? Um, what would make me delete it immediately is somebody that started by saying how great they were and how fabulous they are, or more to the point, somebody who asked for something in the first sentence. Mm -hmm. I have a script. I want you to read it. That delete, 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 delete. I don't know you. Don't ask me to. I, I did a blog post on Hollywood etiquette, and you could see it at my website, which is carolkirshner.com. And it says, do not ask people you do not know to read your script. Um, so the thing that would turn me off is somebody asking me for that, somebody saying, you need to meet me because I'm fantastic. This is the best project you've ever seen. Let me be the judge of that. This is hilarious. Let me be the judge of that. This will make you cry. Let me be the judge of that. Um, so, or somebody that said, and I'm afraid you're going to sue me. That's a delete right there, of course. Um, what would make me pay attention would be if somebody in the first sentence was able to say something about their success in a humble way. Um, I just had a client yesterday who sold a very lucrative business and she was then able to focus totally on her writing. And if you start off with one thing about you that makes you desirable because it's a success, 
it gets people more interested. Um, if you say, as I, you know, encourage her to say, you know, I, I was fortunate, you always say it in a humble way. I was fortunate to have just sold my business um, and am now able, you know, sold my successful business and am now able to focus completely on my writing. So one sentence on that, um, a sentence on why you like my company, um, and then a log line that's really compelling. I have a script um, that uh, I think you might be interested in, not I have a script that you're gonna love. I have a script, I have a project that I think you might be interested in giving your, giving your track record. The log line is X, and then uh, if you're interested in reading it, of course, I'm happy to sign a release. Mm -hmm. That's the right way to do those letters, those emails. Yeah, thank you. So being humble uh, and knowing how to not <laughs> make yourself sound obnoxious in the email while- Right, but still being able to say that you're successful. Yeah, yeah. That's a skill in itself, but you know- you It want is. To you That's what I work with my clients on a lot. Oh, good, good to know. Thank you. Could you please elaborate on the formal structure of a pitch itself? Yeah, I, I printed out the template that I use when I teach this class. Um, <clears throat> this is again, this is for television. Mm -hmm. It's different for features slightly. And let me just tell you that a television pitch in terms of how long it should be a drama pitch should be 15 to 20 minutes. And that includes sort of the small talk part of the, the, the meeting. A comedy should be 10 to 15 minutes. The shorter, the better, because you want them to be interested and ask questions rather than make them fall asleep, which one of my colleagues at CBS actually did because the person went on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and in this day and age, when people are pitching virtually and in Zoom rooms, you have to be even more concise. Mm -hmm. So here's the elements. I love counting things. So here's the 10 basic elements for a successful TV pitch. One is your inspiration story. Mm -hmm. Why you are drawn to this material, how you came up with the idea for it, why you're the only person to write it or produce it. Um, number two is the hook. Why this show? Why now? As I said, there's 500 plus scripted shows. Why is this going to stand out from all the others? Or the, the, um, the buzzwords now are, is it sexy? Is it noisy? Is it buzzy? That's what it needs to be, which usually means it's high concept in some way. You need to hook them by telling them why this project will stand out um, and give them, you can either do it in a visual way, like describe your teaser maybe from your pilot or a scene where we see who the protagonist is, or you might start it with giving a statistic like there were 350 mass shootings in the US last year. This show explores the aftermath of that, you know, something that gets people leaning forward. Then there's your log line. Um, and I always say you include the genre and tone in your log line. Uh, four is you introduce your main characters. And I always say, don't just say it's Maria, she's a quirky saleswoman. Put your characters in a scene mm -hmm. and describe that scene in a way, very short, but let us know who your character is by demonstrating it, not just giving a name and an adjective. Mm -hmm. um, then number five, which is very important, is what is the tone of the show? Um, if you're doing a drama uh, and you're doing a dark drama, 
like um, True Detective. Uh, there's many dark things, uh, dark shows. That's one tone. If you're doing This Is Us, that's a different tone. We, we need to know what the tone is. Is it, and if you're doing comedy, is it Fleabag, which is grounded, or is it Young Sheldon or Big Bang Theory or The Neighborhood or something way over the top? Is it grounded? And grounded means, is it grounded in reality? Or is it larger than life? Or is it science fiction? Is it horror? Is it uh, fantasy? Is it supernatural? Um, that's the genre. And then the tone is, sort of the reality of your series. Uh, six is the world. <clears throat> Explain what the world is, demonstrate it, and let us know why we want to spend 30 hours in this world. Like, is it, is it light and bright like Mrs. Maisel? Do you want to be in that world? Is it creepy like American Horror Story? Describe what the world is. And if it is a genre piece, describe the reality of the world. Can, can people fly? Do people come back from the dead? Is it about zombies who will eat you? And if they eat you, you die. Um, we need to know what the reality of the world is and, and what the rules are. Seven is really important in television. It's the series engine. What is the heart of the conflict that indicates that this show can go five seasons or six seasons with 10 episodes or 13 episodes or 22 episodes each. Is the heart of the conflict strong enough that it'll drive the show for that many episodes? Then eight is you touch on the pilot story. Again, you just do the major story beats and your character arc you do not go beat by beat. Because that's what happened when my colleague fell asleep at CBS. Somebody who should know better, who, who, who was successful as a TV writer came in, said what the world was, said who the characters were, and then said, and we open on this happening. Then the next scene is this. And, and literally my colleague fell asleep, closed his eyes, fell asleep. The writer jumped up and said, he fell asleep? And my boss said, no, 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 that way he just closed his eyes for a minute. So do not go beat by beat. It's just the major points that you want to touch on, including the character arc and always end your pilot story on a cliffhanger. That is what makes people tune in for the next week or much more common now is click through to the next episode. So you have to have a strong cliffhanger. Then nine is you talk about this, the season arcs. So this is how season one begins and how it ends, season two, season three. All you need is three seasons mm -hmm. and you wanna end each season on a cliffhanger. We discover that Maria and Carol really are not dead and they're pissed. Something like that that makes you say, I have to tune, I have to wait the six months until the next uh, season. And then 10 is a coda, which is a summary. And in the coda, it's kind of like the hook again. You're saying why people will watch it without ever saying people will watch it because, or it's a really good show, so people will watch it. You want to talk about the universal themes of it and why now is the time for it, why it's timely, you know, and that's the elements of a successful TV pitch. Thank you. That was a really great elaboration. So for the uh, for the three seasons, uh, writers should not have all the scripts written out. It's just the treatments and just overall description of what's happening. All you need in your Bible is a paragraph, <clears throat> maybe two about each season mm -hmm. that people I do not encourage people to write every episode because if you're fortunate enough to sell it, they're going to change it. And they don't want to read every episode that you've written. It's not going to end up like that. So write a pilot and write a Bible and 
know what your season arcs are going to be, but don't write the episodes. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in seeing a great sample, they can email me at carol at carolkirshner.com and I'll send them the Stranger Things Bible, which is a fantastic example of a great Bible. And they'll see what should be included in the Bible, which should also be included in the pitch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll be sure to put the, the website uh, in the description so everybody knows where to go. Sure. Do you think that during pitching, uh, writers should include uh, cast who they see as possibly a part of the show because there are different different thoughts on that that sometimes a network might not like a specific actor and you might not know that but it also helps them visualize what the show is going to look like so what are your thoughts on that my thought is that you say you talk about the character you say sort of think emma stone so i think you can mention a star's name, but lightly. Don't say only Issa Rae could play this. Mm -hmm. Don't say you have to get um, Nicole Kidman. Mm -hmm. Just say when you're describing the character, think so and so. And I wouldn't do that for every character, just the main characters. Okay. All right. Thank you. If there's interest in the show, hopefully. Uh, then what happens next? What are some steps, some timelines? What should sure. readers expect? Sure. Again, this is television. Mm -hmm. If a producer shows interest in your project, one of two ways. Either they read your script and they're really interested in doing that script, or they read your script and they like the writing, but the project is not for them, but they'd like to find something else to do with you, you come in and pitch other ideas. So you have that meeting. He, here's what the path looks like. So you meet with a producer. The producer is interested in it. The producer either reads your script or hears your pitch and gives you notes. Everybody gives you notes, by the way. So you address those notes. And when the producer's happy, they will take you to the studio and the studio is who pays for the project. The broadcaster, um, CBS, ABC, NBC, and cable channels, basic cable channels and premium cable channels, the studios pay the deficit. And what that means is if you have a show that costs a million dollars, the network might pay 300,000, but the studio is gonna pay 700,000. So the studio is invested in it. So the producer takes you and the project to the studio executives. If the studio executives like the project, they will give you notes and they are not paying you at this point, nor was the producer paying you. You address their notes and they like it, and they're enthusiastic about it, then they take you and the producer and the project to the ultimate buyer, to the network or streamer, streamer or cable channel. And then if they like your idea, they give you notes. Ha! And if you address those notes, if it's a streamer, what they might do is say, we really love this script. They'll buy a script from you. Um, we're not gonna make a pilot, but we want you to start a writer's room, a mini room. And we want you to write six episodes. And we will decide based on those six episodes whether we're gonna give you a series order. If it's at a network or a basic cable channel, if they like it and you write a great script, they'll order a pilot, they'll produce the pilot, and then based on the pilot, they'll decide whether or not they're gonna green light the series. Wow, that's a lot of steps and a lot of notes. <laughs> There's, it's all notes all the time. Yeah. And how would one go about becoming a showrunner on his or her own show? Uh, so uh, we're talking about the ones who want to go beyond just selling the script and actually getting involved. What are the chances of that happening and what kind of skill set should they have for that to happen? Sure. Um, very, very rarely does somebody sell a project and walk away. Okay. 
That just doesn't happen. It happens in features, mm -hmm. but in television, the writer is the queen or the king and they need that voice. They need that perspective in order to have a successful series. So it is very unlikely that you're gonna write a pilot, they'll make the series and then you walk away. Mm -hmm. So here's how people become showrunners. They either move up the ranks on a television show from a staff writer to a story editor to a producer, to a co-executive producer, to executive producer, to ultimately a showrunner, either on that show or someone else's show. Mm -hmm. So that's one in two ways. You move up on your own show, you're way at the top and you take over somebody else's show. You're put with a first time creator, which I'm sure the people watching this would be first time creators. So somebody who's been a showrunner before or who's just about ready to be a showrunner is put with that first time creator and that's how they become the showrunner. Mm. And then the last way for first time creators is you sell the show, they order the show, you will have a showrunner with you. And the reason why is that when a network or cable channel or streamer orders a series, what they are essentially doing is handing over 30, 60, 80 million dollars to someone and saying, deliver eight episodes, 10, 22. They're not going to give it to somebody who's never done it before. But if you write a great show as the first time creator and you have leadership abilities, then in season two or season three, you can become the showrunner. Mm -hmm. And the things that make a good showrunner are the things that make a good manager. So that would be somebody who has leadership skills, somebody who's confident without being arrogant, somebody who's very decisive without being obnoxious, someone who can delegate. That's really important because a showrunner job is way too big for any one person. Um, and a good showrunner is somebody who's compassionate, who cares about her or his crew, staff, everybody that is associated with the project. They want them to have a good quality of life. Um, and that's what makes a successful showrunner. And here's really the truth. You can, as a showrunner, you might write a show and it gets on the air and it fails after two episodes. But if you were a fantastic manager, you will have a chance to be a showrunner again. Mm -hmm. If your show is successful, but you are a terrible showrunner, it is very unlikely that you will get a chance to be a showrunner again. Well, good to know. And uh, when that first time writer uh, gets a successful deal, so for until getting to the showrunner job, uh, just works as staff writer and grows up the ranks on his or her own show or there's some other? No, yeah. they are, if they have no experience whatsoever, yeah. then just they will come in as a producer level mm -hmm. or maybe a, an executive producer. It depends on how much people want that show and how good their agent is. So they are not starting at the bottom. They should not start at the bottom. They have a leadership role in terms of the material. Mm -hmm. They mostly, their, the scripts will go through their computer ultimately. Mm -hmm. And they will become a showrunner in season two or maybe three if they show leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What makes something fail, there's two things, is people are not coming to watch it. That's what makes it fail. That's why they take it off the air. Um, or they have not, the show has not been marketed well. Again, there's 500 plus shows. So whoever the broadcaster is has to promote it in order to get people to watch it, like Queen's Gamut, right? Mm -hmm. Or The Crown people, it breaks through all of the 500 
and people find out about it, like Russian Doll did. I love that show. Um, so the reason they fail is because people are not watching it. Sometimes it's because it's a shitty show and it's not good and no one's interested. And sometimes it's a really good show, but not enough people are watching it. Mm -hmm. But how do, like you said, shitty shows, how do they pass if it's so many steps to go through? How do they even go through? <laughs> it just it always surprises Because me. there's so many things that are involved besides just the script. Mm -hmm. um, casting can make something shitty. Um, how it's directed can make it less than stellar. The script may have started out great, but with all those notes, it becomes something totally different and mushy. Mm -hmm. And that sucks. Yeah. But they made a commitment to put it on the air and they do. Or there's a star that's attached to it and they want that star on their network, but the show is lousy, but the star likes it. Yeah. So those are the kind of ways that happens. Do you think that aspiring writers who are just at the beginning of their path need to have a, uh, an agent to submit their work? Or do you think it's possible to pitch themselves to get that first sale? Because then agents start coming to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, let me ask you, my expertise is in television. I know something about features, but I can speak mostly to television. Um, you really do need an agent or manager if you're just starting out to open the doors for you. They will um, make the calls, they'll introduce you, they'll get your material out there and help those meetings get set up. With personal relationships, you can get directly to them. Mm -hmm. If you win one of the top contests, they producers will find you. Um, and that 95% of the time you want an agent or manager to get you in the door. It is hard to do it on your own. Some people are able to do it through social media, through LinkedIn. Um, I don't know how successful they've been at that. Um, <clears throat> but if you can get an agent or manager, that is going to help your career tremendously. The other thing, though, is that you need to foster relationships within the entertainment industry. And you can, if you have a personal relationship with somebody and they respond to your material, say, would you be willing to make an introduction to a producer for me? Mm -hmm. How different is entertainment career coach from a manager? Really good question. Yeah. Um, an entertainment career coach you pay me mm -hmm. up front mm -hmm. and I am just there for you. I am there to help you strategize your career. I am there to support you. I'm there in terms of accountability. A manager is somebody that you pay. When you make money, you give them a percentage, usually five or 10% of everything you make. They also help you with your career. And the major difference besides the fact that they're making money off of you all the time. And so sometimes their direction for what they want you to do is can sometimes be more about what their goals are than what your goals are. That doesn't happen all the time, but it does sometimes. And managers can set up meetings for you. They send your material out and they set up meetings for you. And that is not what I do as a career coach. Mm -hmm. um, we're both here for writers and directors and producers. Managers have the relationships throughout the community to send that material out and to get those meetings. Mm -hmm. What would be your either three key pieces of advice or some mistakes to avoid, or possibly some life lessons. Uh, it doesn't have to be your mistakes, maybe some mistakes that you watched <laughs> the writers that who you work with make along their career, but what would be something that you tell those at the very beginning of the path today? Yes. Well, first of all, I will reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. Write something that has meaning to you, but is still universal. Mm 
something that's very specific to you, but totally universal. And then, you know, I've studied over the years what made successful people successful in this business and why they were different than the people that went back to Ohio or media and uh, became sold, self sold insurance. Um, and I came up with four things they had in common. And one was they had blazing hot material. It wasn't just good, it was fantastic. The people that succeeded for the most part had fantastic material. Two is they had a smart self-marketing strategy. They knew how to talk about themselves in a way that got people excited. Three is they had a comprehensive and growing community of contacts, of mutually, mutually beneficial relationships, not just what can you do for me, but how can I help you? And four is they were industry savvy. They learned about the business. They learned about the part of the business they were interested in. They knew who the players were and who the trends are, what the trends are. Um, so getting strong on all four of those topics, those pillars will help you succeed. Here's mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, don't be an asshole. Can I say that? Sure. Don't be an asshole. Be generous. Mm -hmm. Don't um, help other people. Um, don't be selfish. Uh, when you hear notes, don't be defensive. Really hear the note behind the note. I've seen people who were very talented, but they ended up on the life is too short list because they were prima donnas, because they were difficult to work with. Um, and, you know, really for me, it comes down to being a good person and giving back, helping other people. And if you're not doing that, I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was very moving and very inspiring. And overall, this has been really fantastic masterclass because it was just so detailed. And I'm sure everybody who's been watching has been putting down notes. And I hope you have that list of 10 to include in your pitch. And Carol, thank you so much for giving time, for, for sharing the, the words of guidance. And uh, I really hope that all of you aspiring writers uh, will benefit greatly from this masterclass and we hope to see your films not, tv shows actually in this case tv shows on the major streaming platforms and good luck to everybody and thank you very much again carol it is my pleasure and good luck everybody <laughs>